Well, welcome to our service uh, this morning here at Christ Community Church. Whether you're joining us uh, online, um, which we had a little hiccup with just, so uh, that's why we're just running a little bit late today, but that's sorted now. So welcome if you're joining us online, and welcome to everyone that's gathered here uh, in the building too. Uh, still a few chairs, I think, uh, over there, so there we go. There's a children's chorus that says, Our God is a great big God. And uh, what we try to do sometimes is avoid using big words to describe God because it gives the impression that he might be inaccessible. And God is anything but inaccessible because of what Christ has done for us at Calvary. Um, but... There's a sense in which, here's a big word, there's a sense in which God is transcendent. And what that means is that it doesn't matter how long we um, spend uh, learning about God and our relationship with him growing through Christ, that there's always something new to learn about God because he always transcends our understanding of him because he is so great. That's one of the reasons that, that it's so exciting to be a Christian is that we never come to an end of learning more and more about the God who loves us and uh, has died to save us. So the, the hymn that we're going to sing to begin today says, Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. And we're going to stand and sing that together as we praise the Lord and we wonder at his, his greatness. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Lord, when we think of all the ways that that hymn describes you, we are reminded that we can begin this prayer with the words, Lord, our God. And Lord, our God, we bring that praise to you this morning, for you are immortal, uh, invisible, uh, you dwell in light, uh, you are the one who knows all things and sees all things and is all powerful. And yes, we can call you Abba Father. We can know you as our Lord and our King and our Saviour. So we bring our praise to you this morning. We pray that in all that we do today, we might bring glory to you. And Lord, that you would speak to us through the worship and through your word. Bless him as he comes to speak to us later, we pray. And Lord, we commit our service to you today. We pray that you might build us up in your word. Prepare us for those works of service that you uh, have for us to do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing again, and uh, it's King of the Ages, Almighty God, perfect love, ever just and true. Tense. And um, his name is Steve Cash. 
If we had really sophisticated um, uh, camera work and all kinds of things, we would now be able to pan in <laughs> on Steve, and all of you online would be able to see them. I'm not going to embarrass Steve by inviting him out the front, Steve, don't worry, you're, you're okay. Um, um, but we, yeah, it's, it's, we don't celebrate every birthday that there is. Um, as there have been more and more of us, that became more and more difficult over the years. Um, but when there's a special birthday over a certain number, then we do acknowledge that and give thanks to the Lord. So, um, see what, um, as a family, we're learning this memory verse from um, uh, Psalm 34, um, but I haven't memorised it yet, so I'm going to read it. Um, and I'm going to pray it for you and pray for the Lord's blessing on you as we give thanks uh, to the Lord's goodness to you over the years and pray that he would continue that in the years to come. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. <coughs> fear the Lord, you his holy people. Those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. I'm really impressed no one roared um, at the mention of lions. Usually um, that happens. So let's, uh, let's just pray for Steve. Father, we thank you um, for Steve and for his birthday. And we thank you that Steve is a man who has tasted and seen that you are good. And he's discovered how taking refuge in you is a great, great blessing. Thank you for all that you have led him and Isabel through in uh, the years that you've given them. Ways that at times they have experienced weakness and lack, and yet they have never lacked in you. They've always found you to be good. And thank you that that will be the case as they look and they hope in you. And the questions and the heartaches that they still have will be um, made right in you and that there will be a day of tears being wiped away. And I pray that for Steve in the year and the years ahead, you would bless him and help him to further taste and see just how good you are, how much you love him in Christ, what a blessing it is that your spirit uh, dwells in him and that you would please have your hands upon him and on Isabel and on the whole family. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, um, if the crest would like to go out uh, now, Angela's going to be helping you with that. I'm going to give this to Steve and then we'll carry on. Uh, Happy birthday. Um, um, in here, we're going to be turning um, to God's Word. We're going to have our time of intercession just a little bit later. Um, we're going to have the reading and then turn to God's Word, and uh, James is going to come and read um, 1 Timothy and 1 to us. Tim. Oh, sorry. Technical. The reading is 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 8 to 20, and it's on page 1191 of the Church Bibles. <coughs> 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 8 to 20. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing, practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to, to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out in me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, 
so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them you may fight the battle well holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Let's, uh, let's pray as we come to God's word. Just start to read uh, from, one, from James chapter 1. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. <coughs> Father James goes on to describe you know, your word as a mirror. Please help us now as we uh, come to your words to see uh, not just who you are and what you're like but also who we are and what we're like. And then Lord, may that not just be snatched away from us as we go from here. But please may we be changed as a church. May we be changed, each of us here, by what we hear you speak to us. Thank you for um, this book of 1 Timothy. Thank you that while Paul wrote it to Timothy and to the church there in Ephesus, it's also true that your spirit was at work and causing that to happen, so that this might be your word to us today too. And so we thank you uh, for that, and ask for your help and your blessing by your Spirit in these moments. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. <coughs> um, maybe just a moment to apologise for those who will be watching this later. We've had a problem on the live stream and it's just sort of stopped, so we're recording it and we'll upload it um, later on. Um, so uh, anyone who sort of is here having thought, oh, I'm going to come rather than watch the live stream, great decision, <laughs> really good decision um, to be here. Um, but we'll, we'll get it back up as soon as we can. Well, churches go wrong when Jesus and his gospel is not front and centre, inside out in that church. And Christian leaders go wrong when Jesus and his gospel is in front and centre and inside out. That's what's um, happening in Ephesus as we um, join in this uh, series. I know some of us uh, may be here and uh, missed last week. Uh, well, that's what we're, we're, we're discovering. Uh, this place, Ephesus, is where um, Timothy is, and Paul is writing to, to, to Timothy. Uh, Timothy's a Christian leader. And uh, if you don't know where Ephesus is, it's, it's a modern, modern Turkey. Um, there's Ephesus there. Um, and uh, uh, it had been a powerhouse as a, as a church. Um, people had become Christians, and there had been dramatic transformation in their lives. It had caused a real stir in the whole city of Ephesus. And Paul himself had been there and had been um, teaching the church for two to three years there. So it was a really um, great church. And yet, within a few years, the leaders had arisen who moved away from Jesus and the gospel. All that's good and right and true. And so Paul's left Timothy there to try and sort this out and to put things right. And to help this inward-looking, anemic church that was drifting from Jesus and the gospel. And friends, if that could happen in Ephesus, that could happen um, anywhere. That kind of thing could happen uh, here. Well, why does Paul care about it happening? Why does he care about what happens um, in a local church? Why has God's Spirit seen that this is God's word to us today? Well, we just briefly looked at it last week. We saw that later on in the letter, in, in 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, and you can turn over the page in the church Bibles and just see this, um, God has a wonderful plan for us as a church. We're God's household, we're told. And he's writing these instructions so that if I'm delayed, Timothy, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. 
That's what the church is. That's what we belong to as we come to trust Jesus, as we're baptised into his name and, and into his people. And God addresses us as Christians in this kind of way, as a flock, as um, a body, as a building, as a family. And you know, we don't need convincing, do we, that we're all individuals. We arrived individually here this morning or in, in cars with a few other people or we walked with someone else. But we're individuals here, aren't we? You, you can see the edge between you and the next person on the seat. And yet, God calls us to be part of a whole as well. And God wants us, us, to be healthy, spiritually healthy. Last week we saw that spiritual sickness was affecting the local church in Ephesus um, and, and that that sickness was false teaching. And the answer to that was that Timothy was to remove uh, those leaders from teaching. They were to not teach any more. Well, this week, we're looking at sort of the flip side of that, which is a call to faithful uh, leadership in the church. But this passage is a sort of interesting one, a slightly strange one, because um, uh, if you were here last week and we ended in verse 7 last week, we could actually go from verse 7 straight to verse 18, and we wouldn't think that there was a problem. If you covered up verse 12, uh, verse 8 to um, 17, if you even got a rubber and rubbed them out, you would never spot that there was anything missing from the letter. Okay? Paul does what, what some of us do sometimes in the conversation. You start saying one thing, and then you just like, oh, I'm going to say something else. And, there's a kind of, and then you come back to the, the thing. That's what Paul's doing in most of our passage this morning. He takes a detour. And I'm so glad that he did. And that God oversaw uh, that, of course. Now, why does he do that? At one level, there are just a few things. So, one level, verses 8 to 11, um, he's been talking about people misusing the Lord, the law, the Old Testament law, and he doesn't want anyone to get the wrong end of the stick. And so he says, look, the, end, the law's good if you, lo- if you use it for the purpose it's meant for, if you use it lawfully. So, there's one thing just that comes up because he's mentioned <coughs> teachers of the law who are doing the wrong thing, so he doesn't want people to get the wrong impression, so he talks positively about the uh, the law in that sense. And then in verses 12 to 17, I think there's one level in which he knows that because he's saying to Timothy, look, you've got to tell people, some leaders, to not do what they're doing in leadership. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine that sort of situation in a local church? Where you're telling, saying to some of the leaders, imagine one of the leaders here, you can't teach anymore. That's going to cause quite a, an issue, isn't it? And you might expect there to be a little bit of a, a confrontation. And in that sort of situation, authority matters. I said last week that this letter is a bit like captain's orders um, on a ship. And the whole ship's company know what the orders are. The admiralty sent those orders. They're kind of public orders. They're addressed to the captain, but everyone knows. So everyone knows what the captain's supposed to be doing. And so, of course, the thing that really matters is the authority of the admiral, of the admiralty. Well, the admiral in this situation is Paul. And Paul had a past. Paul wasn't always a lovely man. And he goes into some of that here. We'll look at that in a bit. And so the, those who were are, who are being silenced, who were being shut down um, by Timothy, might well have said, well, look, how can you say this to us? How can we listen to this man, Paul, who sent you, when we know that he was such a murderous man? And he hated the church. And we, feel, we don't feel safe with Paul. He's threatening our space. They might have said something like that. Shut him down. And so verses 12 to 17 is his defence of Paul and his apostolic ministry. The fact that Jesus appointed him to be his special representative and to have a special authority in the early church as they got hold of the truth about Jesus and uh, the churches were established. And by the way, that is still needed today. So we're still, on the, we're still not on the main line yet, but it's really important in that application because today... There's a mainstream and kind of and widespread rejection of Paul. Maybe in your mind, there's a kind of bit of a negative response when you, someone mentions Paul, and you kind of uh, hmm. There's a separation of Paul from Jesus, and we need to be really clear that Jesus chose Paul. He appointed Paul. There was no mistake or no embarrassment from Jesus about Paul. And despite everything that Paul had done, all but um, we're going to see his blasphemous, um, his blaspheming. And his murderous intent, his violence. Well, Jesus wasn't embarrassed by his past. And nor was he embarrassed by the things that Paul would say, because Paul would say them because God was uh, commissioning him to say those uh, things. Paul is the 
is a Jew for the non-Jews. He was charged by Jesus to evangelize the world, to see that platform laid for the evangelization of the world. He is our apostle, our apostle, here in Tipton today. And to disagree with Paul is to disagree with Jesus. And I think we'll come back to that as we go through the letter, because there are some controversial bits in the teaching. And uh, that's partly why I just raised that. We need to be really clear as to who Paul is and um, why he's got this special role from Jesus. But I think really the heart of these verses, and why Paul kind of goes into them, is that he's opening up his heart to Timothy and to the church in Ephesus. He's actually opening up God's heart too. And he's doing that so that they, so that we, can be spiritually healthy. We're going to see two things this morning, but we're going to be majoring on the first one. The first one is this a healthy church and healthy leaders know we've gone very wrong and that God's been amazingly kind to put us right. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that a healthy church and healthy leaders know we could go wrong and so choose God's glorious gospel as our lifelong fight. And if we take on board those two things, that will really help us to be healthy as a church and for us who are leaders and as we think about the kind of leaders that we listen to and look for, um, then that will be a real help to us. And it's my prayer that it would um, be that help to us. So first of all, um, this uh, point, a healthy church and healthy leaders know we've gone very well and that God's been amazingly kind to put us right. So verses 8 to 11, and um, Paul's reminding Timothy and the other leaders, church, that God's law is good. Verse 9, um, in verse 9, it actually... <coughs> In our version, so end of verse eight, it says the law is good if one uses it properly. Um, and I'd be missing a trick here. It would be better translated lawfully. There's a little pun there. Those who like puns, it's a little pun. The law is good if you use it lawfully. Okay, it's lawful, not awful. <laughs> How? Verse nine. It's not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels. Then he's saying it's got no use for us as Christians. And we're going to see later on in the lesson, he's going to use the law uh, as an authority in our lives as how to live the new life that God gives us. But here Paul's worried about how inward looking uh, the church uh, in Ephesus have become. The law's being used in a wrong kind of way, in-house, for speculations and to try and gain knowledge in some kind of mystical um, way. Um, uh, uh, in uh, 1 verse 4 uh, there's, uh, there's a devotion of selves to, to false doctrines um, myths, endless uh, genialities, obscure parts of Old Testament law uh, were being used to kind of build up a sense of deep spirituality um, by people we're told in verse 7 uh, they don't know what they're talking about <laughs> um, and the result um, was a killer um, to mission, that, so that's I've lost track of the slides that's the, uh, they don't know what they're talking about and the result of that was envy and strife and malice. And if you, friends, if you come into a group, any group, a, 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 a bowling club, um, a darts club, um, a knitting group, and you find it full of envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions and constant friction between people, are you coming back next week? Are you listening to what they have to say? No. It's a real killer um, for mission. And so, um, one verse nine, the law is for those who are out there. The unrighteous, um, Paul's saying. It's got a missionary point to it. To show Jew and non-Jew alike how far we've fallen from God. How we're far from him. It's to be a mirror to show us who we are and what we're like. And I know we all love the, the sort of that nursery rhyme bit that we mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest of them all? And we look, we, we're looking to see which is our best side. And the, you know, God, which is the bit that's really good about me? And it's not to say there aren't good bits about us, but actually the Lord tells us the other side as well, and the worst side, the inside actually, which is where those things come from. I, so God's always there to show us what's wrong. I heard a bit of an interview um, this week on um, YouTube, um, an interview with a, a UK pastor from Bristol, um, and uh, a little while ago he, he found a, um, a small lump, and it wasn't very much, um, but um, he wasn't going to do anything. I think, I think friends or his wife, probably his wife, um, I don't know, someone said, go, go and get it checked out. And so he, he went um, to uh, the doctor and it turned out, although it was small, it, it was uh, cancerous. And it wasn't just there, it was in three or four 
um, other places. You see, he felt healthy. So it was a bit ridiculous to go to the doctor. But actually, he had a problem. That's God's law. God's law tells us we have a problem. <coughs> Verse 10 tells us the width of that uh, problem. This list gives us that, that, that width of, and, and the depth, how wide our problem is. It's not that we're all going to be all of these categories and all these things, um, but it's a grim picture. We've turned from God and from others. As you go through that list, you can see them all. The, 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 God, the ways we turn from God and the ways we're um, turning from each other. And as you uh, read through this list, I'm going to put it this way because it's let the reader understand that you understand why I'm doing that. Some of the ways will be ways that our society turns a blind eye to, or even approves of, or even celebrates. But God's law tells us what God thinks about these things. And verse 10 and 11, moving into 11, the gospel agrees. The law and the gospel are together in, in the right way of understanding that. We have all gone wrong. That is being a Christian 101, is knowing that you're wrong. It's being a Christian leader 101, knowing that you're wrong. It's being a Christian church 101, knowing that we're wrong. And it was very personal to Paul. Look at verse uh, 13. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. That was Paul's past. And yet God had been so, so very kind to him and set him right. We've never done this here. I don't know if you've ever seen it done. Cardboard testimonies. You come across those? Um, I, I secretly love them. Not all of them are good, but many of them are. They're very powerful. And people come to the front of a building uh, on, a, you know, on a stage or they are on camera and they have a piece of cardboard. And on one side of it is written one thing, and on the other side is another thing. And it's very simple, you don't have much space on a piece of cardboard, do you? It's not a long thing. And it's not a spoken thing, it's a silent thing. So the person comes and stands at the front, and in this situation she says, never quite good enough. And that's how she felt, and that's how she experienced her life. And then she turns it around, but she's come to know God's power is perfect in my weakness. Or well, this guy here, I don't know if you can read that, he says that he was a womanizer, an adulterer, drug user, an alcoholic, and a dealer, verbally abusive. And if some of you will also be troubled that he can't spell, but that's okay. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the big E on the eye chart um, in that one, okay? That was his life. Now imagine, imagine you're sitting next to someone like that. Would you feel comfortable? But then that's not the whole picture. He turns it round. God cleansed me and set me free. What would Paul's cardboard testimony say? Well, on one side it would be blasphemer, persecutor, violent man. You're getting the bus tomorrow? Wait, no, you're not because it's late. On Tuesday. And someone was there and they have a t-shirt saying, I'm a violent man. Where do you sit? <laughs> yeah, the bus, yeah? That was Paul. That was who he, that was his past. But God had changed him and cleansed him and turned him around. Such that, well, what would he have now on it? Well, verse 12, um, the risen Jesus had commissioned him. Maybe he had commissioned on that cardboard. Commissioned to be sent to the non-Jews to proclaim God's good news to them. He'd been um, deemed trustworthy, entrusted with the gospel, entrusted with his message for the world. And verse 16, he was converted from his sin, from his unbelief, to be a man alive with love for God and for others through his trust in Jesus, who had loved him, died for him, and cleansed him. Verse 13, Paul isn't making excuses for himself. When he says, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance, he still needed mercy. But though ignorant and unbelieving, he was still responsible for his sin, for his self-righteousness, for his Christ-hating. And God had given him grace. Uh, verse 14, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. I don't know how true this is. This is one of those preacher stories. 
that's true in a deeper sense, I don't know if it's strictly true in the narrow sense, um, but there was an art gallery um, that had a, someone um, submitted a, 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 a painting of um, Niagara Falls, but it, it didn't have a title, and so they decided to give it a title, and someone, the person who was given that job, titled it More to Follow. More to Follow. What a lovely way of capturing what God is like. There's more to follow. Abundant kindness. Grace poured upon Paul to wash away his rottenness, to wash away all that sin that was such an offence to God and such a, a, a hurt to others. Giving a new status, a new heart. And that's what's come to us if we're a Christian. Just like it came to, to, to Paul, as Christ came to Paul on the road to Damascus. Look at verse... Um, 15 uh, down in your Bibles. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Why does Paul say that? It's a great verse, isn't it? It's a really good one to remember. Um, and if you do memory verses, um, that's a greater memory verse. And then one to chew over and to pray through and to ask God to give you greater understanding and experience of each part. Of, of that verse. Well, I don't think he gave it for us for a memory verse. He gave it so that Timothy, so the Christians in Ephesus, so that we would take this to heart. This is why Christ Jesus came into the world, to save sinners. And, and why mention this here? Verse 16 nails the reason. Um, but for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. It's so that you and I would be encouraged. Do you ever feel like God couldn't forgive you? Do you ever feel like you're just too far from, from God? You've gone too far wrong. Christ Jesus is full of patience to Paul. He's full of patience to you before, your life before, your life now, your life forever. Can you be too far from God? No way. Last century in Japan, there was a man called Tokishi um, Ishii, and he was hung for murder, and he was a horrible guy. Two um, uh, sing single lady missionaries gave him a New Testament, and he was converted and came to know Christ. And uh, before he was hung, he said, perhaps in the future someone in the world may hear that the most desperate villain who ever lived repented of his sins and was saved by the power of Christ and so may come to repent themselves. Amazing. That's what Paul's saying. That's what Paul, why Paul puts this here, so that we will be encouraged that we too, though we've gone wrong, can experience the amazing kindness of uh, uh, God in Christ and be forgiven. Now maybe one or two of us got the opposite problem. Maybe you think you're too good. You'd never say that, would you? But you do, really. You're a pretty wonderful person. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. And we're honoured to be in your presence. But maybe there's something here as well. Paul had to say this. Paul, who was the great apostle, said that he was the worst of sinners. Well, friends, if, if Paul said that, I, I don't really think you can um, top Paul and who you are. Paul said this, I'm the worst. It is you, I'm the first. And he took personal responsibility. He didn't compare himself to others. He didn't say, well, I'm the best person in this room, quite frankly. He said, before a holy God, before God, I'm the first. I am the, I am, I am the worst sinner. It doesn't matter what anyone else is doing. How I have lived before God and before others has been abominable. I've been wrong. But I've been rescued. So no wonder verse 12 begins with, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. And verse 17 ends with, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. Hey, that would be a really good way to start a song. Um, <laughs> be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks and praise flow from Paul, even as he writes this letter, because of how God's treated him. Is that happening in your life? Are you finding that thanks and praise is something that are coming more and more as you reflect on how God has treated you? You. Is that happening in my life? Is that what marks us as a church? Or do we just stand for the next hymn and trust that? Is it real thanks and praise that we're expressing in all kinds of ways? If we're a true Christian, if we're a true Christian church, there will be a healthy growing in that way. But in order for that to happen, it's vital 
that we know we're wrong. We can't be right until we know we're wrong. It's vital that we know that God has put us right. And not just barely, like some exams I passed by a mark, you know, just, just made it. No, abundantly, Niagara Falls, there's more to come. Like just loads of grace and mercy, rich and abundant. Health is, it comes as we grow lower, but are lifted higher because of Jesus, to be filled with thanks and praise. And so what power the gospel has, what power the gospel has to change us, to change others, to change lives now, to change eternities. But speculative teaching and mysticism doesn't. And that's what was going on in Ephesus. There was false teaching. I came across um, this, this week. I think if you know Richard Coles, he's retired um, from um, being a vicar. And if you know him, you'll know he's not um, a Bible man. And he's not a man following off God. In fact, he's a man who uh, would come in the verse uh, 10 and 11, some of the things he's um, ongoing uh, his life. But this is what he said this week. The churches that are Bible, and he's talking as a Church of England guy, by that I mean growing in numbers and income, tend to be conservative, punchy, fundamentalist in matters of scripture, rigorous in matters of doctrine. And that's what he was saying on TV or in the paper, I can't remember. Look at this gospel. Look what it did to Paul. Look what it does to every sinner. To you, to me. Why would we abandon it for false teaching which doesn't do anything? Which doesn't help us? Which doesn't glorify God? I think that's why Paul's gone on this detour. To, to, to minister to us. But also to convince us afresh that this is where we should be. And this is where the leaders of this church in Ephesus should be. And the leaders of every church should be. The gospel is for us. And it's for others. So these verses aren't static. As if the church is a museum in which the truth is carefully kept intact and safe. Are you on the dusting road this week to dust and maintain the truth? No. This is all about a commission for mission. Paul would have been commissioned for mission. And this is the heartbeat of, of this letter, which is a vital context to see it all in. Why did Christ Jesus come into the world? To save sinners. That's the dynamic. And that's why Paul was an apostle. And that's why there's a local church in Ephesus. And that's why there's a local church in Tipton. And that's why we pray and work alongside and encourage faithful local churches all across the black country and all across our nation. It's all about a conversion which Paul experienced and which could be for anyone, whatever their background, whatever your background. So a healthy church, a healthy leader, and I ask, are we that? Are, are, you, are you a healthy Christian? Am I a healthy leader? We know we've gone very wrong, and that God has been amazingly kind to put us right through Jesus. I really hope I haven't said anything new to you, but it's really important. Paul didn't think he was writing something new to Timothy or to the church there, but they needed reminding, and so did we. Secondly, and much more briefly, just the last few verses of our passage. A healthy church and healthy leaders know we could go wrong and we choose God's glorious gospel as our lifelong fight. You see, we now resume this appeal to Timothy. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command. It's the appeal for Timothy to choose, to choose what he's going to do, to choose which direction he's going to be going in. There are these false teachers, there's Paul, where's Timothy going to go, what's he going to do? And he reminds Timothy of how God's appointed him to be a leader. And that appointment hasn't come to puff him up, to make him to strut his stuff. No, it's so that he would be passionate for God's glory and for the good of others through the gospel. To oppose false teaching and false teachers. To hold to the faith. He's told there, isn't he? Um, uh, verse 19, holding to the faith and a good conscience. You think, well, what does that mean? We'll come back next week into verses um, t 2, what, 1 to 7, and we're going to see it means prayer and witness. Again, it's not like, make sure on your bookshelf are some really long, boring books that you look after and dust every now and again. No, it's a commitment to walk with the living God prayerfully 
and looking to see others come to know him through Christ. But that's a spiritual battle. It's going to be a fight. You may fight the battle well. People are going to oppose you. Satan is mentioned in verse 20. And in the midst of all of this, it's vital that Timothy holds on to faith, the faith, the truth about Jesus, what we just thought about, and a good conscience. In other words, that he himself is repenting of his sin, is turning to Christ, and is following him day by day by day by day. And there are rocks out there, Paul says, verse 19, some have rejected this and have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. In fact, he names two of them. Can you imagine that moment in Ephesus where the names were mentioned? And I can't even replicate it because even to name some names would be besmirching someone's character. But can you imagine a named individual who we had known, who had stood here, speaking God's truth, teaching us? And now we were reading that they've rejected the faith. Maybe you can name some. Sadly, I can name some who I have counted my friends who have taken this path. So let me just urge myself, um, let me urge um, fellow uh, leaders here, hold on to the faith and a good conscience too. Um, I, don't, I don't literally pray Psalm 19, but, I'm, um, but I do sometimes, and I make it my prayer, and I've been convicted from this week to make it my prayer more than I do. Because it's a prayer that helps us deal with our conscience. And so it's applicable to all of us. Who can discern their own errors? It's hard, isn't it, to see where we're going wrong. But forgive my hidden faults. So it's a coming to the Lord, asking for his mercy. Keep me from willful sins. May they not rule over me. But then I will be blameless and listen to the great transgression. Those great turnings away don't just come out of nowhere. They come because we start compromising and we start drifting and we stop saying sorry and stop repenting and we don't receive God's forgiveness through Christ and we just drift and become hardened. Because let's not do that. Let's hold on to faith and a good conscience. Don't lose the gospel for yourself. Don't lose the gospel and the gospel part for others. Maybe you think, well, this could never happen here. Never happen at Grace Community Church. When it happened in Ephesus, and they didn't just have Paul for two and three years, as I said at the beginning. They had Apollos, they had Priscilla, and they had Aquila. They had like a who's who of really great Christian leaders. And they went wrong. Please pray. Pray for us as a church. Pray for us as leaders. Pray uh, that the Lord will help us to hold on to the faith and a good conscience. And please, always view the gospel of our Lord Jesus as more important than any person who stands here. Because if we go wrong, we need to go, not the gospel. And I'm going to resist the temptation to do a Jürgen Klopp illustration, um, but you can tell Steve that I was very self-controlled and I didn't use a Jürgen Klopp illustration. And, uh, anyone knows football will understand it, but you can fill in the back. In the back. Last thing to say, because I want us to go away just thrilled that God's been so kind to us, uh, there's a sense of soberness, isn't there, of importance of this, but hasn't God been kind to us? Though we've gone so wrong, he's put us right. And although we could go wrong, he's given us the gospel to hold on to and to keep going in. And that's where we want to sort of go from. But there is a question here, I think, about those who fail. And it comes from verse 20. Such a painful thing, isn't it? These leaders have been uh, handed over to Satan um, to be taught not to blaspheme. A really serious thing, isn't it, to send someone out of the church? But note here how glorious, even here, the gospel is. A massive point and reason for sending someone out of fellowship is so we can welcome them back in again. These two leaders are to be taught not to blaspheme. And hang on, that brings a bell. Look at verse 13. Do you remember someone else who used to blaspheme? Paul. Even there, even to those who feel so wrong, there's a message of mercy. Friends, if that's you in some way, or if you know someone who's done that, they're actually a Christian leader, you can say to them, turn back. Leave that blasphemy, leave that way. Recognise you're a lawbreaker, but come and stand on the massive 
weight of cleansing grace that there is in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you want us to be healthy Christians, uh, healthy uh, leaders, a healthy church. We freshly receive that tr truth, that in order to be healthy, we have to realise how unhealthy we are, how deeply we've gone wrong, and how badly we could go wrong, but also to take hold of how kind you've been to us, that as we repent and believe, as Christ came to save sinners, that's us, and he saves us that we're loved by you, that your kindness is poured out on us abundantly, that we can stand before you and with others, um, forgiven and uh, uh, yours forever. Please restore and renew, renew that vision of ourselves, that understanding of ourselves in us, but also that, give us that heart for others, that as you've been so kind to us, that we would long for others to come to know you too. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we have fresh in our minds all the things that we've just shared from God's Word, let's uh, sing. Uh, grace and peace. Grace and peace, how oh, hell can this be for lawbreakers and thieves, for the worthless, the least? Let's uh, stand and sing together.
come to our Father God in prayer. Let's pray. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Lord, we stop to take this in, to think of what this forgiveness means. The opportunity for a right relationship with you. And because of this wonderful gift with you, that is completely undeserved, but freely given to us, help us daily to love from a pure heart and in good conscience and with sincere faith in you. In a way that together as a church, we may demonstrate clearly to those around as we live out our lives in thankfulness to you, our love for each other, our desire to listen attentively to your word, and our thankfulness for the hope we find in you. Help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on you, fixed firmly on you. May we love you more, may we know you more, understand you more, grow our vision of you, that we may serve you better. And help us, Lord, to demonstrate this love by caring for those among us who are in ill health and have limited opportunities to meet and be in fellowship with us. We pray particularly at the moment for Vera in hospital and for Iris Paul. And we pray also for Betty and Charlie and Sheila and Trev and Mars and Margaret Downton and Jean and Alwyn. That even though they face daily challenges, that they may continue to grow in their faith, to cling to you and have a deeper understanding of the hope we all have in Jesus. Help us to know how best to support them prayerfully and help them to continue to know the joy of serving you. Father, help us to serve faithfully those we have the privilege of serving weekly who don't yet know you through brigade and play and stay. May all we do demonstrate our faith and trust in you and help us to use every opportunity we have to share the reason for the hope we have in you. Father, today we particularly pray for help for the elders as they meet this afternoon. Lord, as, we, as they meet, we pray that you grant them wisdom. As they serve us by leading your church here at Grace, keep them faithful to your word, and may all they do honour you. And as your church, help us to remain teachable as you lead us through them. And Father, as we think further afield, we thank you, Lord, that we can bring things to you that sometimes are out of our grasp. Uh, Lord, we think um, we want to pray for, for Birmingham City Mission. Lord, for the whole of that work, the faithful work that's being done there to share the love of Jesus. But we pray particularly for the Spring Convention next weekend, for Andrew Watson, who's preaching, and preaching on the confidence in the living God. May he faithfully preach your word and for all the practicalities involved in putting on a convention, may they be overruled. Lord, we ask all these things for the glory of your gospel. Amen. Amen. Father God, as we worship you this morning, we pray also for your people throughout your world. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters, those like us who minister in freedom in rich countries. Lord, as we contend with the God of materialism and with apathy and ignorance towards your word, moved by your spirit, we pray that they and we may hold fast to scripture and seek faithfully to share the truth of the gospel. Father, graciously be at work, we pray, that we may see hearts turned to you. 
We pray for your church, Lord, ministering in areas where such ministry brings the risk of persecution and of physical danger. Father, protect these brothers and sisters, we pray. And amidst hardship and oppression, grant them encouragement as they see your spirit at work in their lives and in the communities in which they live. And Father, we lift to you also those churches who minister in areas of great poverty and hardship. Father, may these brothers and sisters who are poor in the things of this earth feast on the living bread and know that in you they are stories of riches for eternity. Lord, preserve and sustain them, we pray. Give them today their daily bread. And finally, Lord, we would continue to hold before you the peoples of Ukraine and Russia. Lord, we bring to you every child and every adult. And Father, we long in that situation and throughout our world for the time when weapons of war are beaten into plowshares. When nations no longer lift up sword against nations. Father, we cry out to you for peace. Lord, please protect those whose only desire, who only desire and deserve to live in security and safety. Comfort those who fear for their lives at this time and the lives of their loved ones. Strengthen those who are bereaved. And Father, please change the hearts of those set on violence and aggression and fill leaders with the wisdom that leads to peace. We pray for your people in Ukraine, in Russia and in neighbouring countries, particularly Poland. Again, Lord, we pray for your protection upon them and for your gracious provision and overruling as they continue to minister, to minister truth and love in the midst of pain, heartbreak and devastation. Father, in these situations which we cannot fully comprehend, please overrule in your sovereign power. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Father, hear these prayers which we offer to you in the name of our risen Saviour, <coughs> Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It's, it's wonderful, isn't it, that it doesn't matter how wonderful we are, or how wonderful we wish we were, but now that we are, that God's grace uh, can silence. So we can sing, who our Lord can silence themselves, their own soul.
arise and to hear Christ's call to follow him and to serve him and to bring that gospel of peace uh, to those that he leads us to. So let's, let's sing that together, our church.
and close, and then we're going to do our um, uh, the, the, the new, church news. So let's uh, let's pray as we stand. Uh, may the God of peace, who brought, um, who through the blood of the eternal, uh, sorry, who through the blood of the eternal covenant <coughs> brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great Shepherd of the sheep, equip us with everything good, for doing His will, and may He work in us what's pleasing to Him through Jesus Christ. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Please sit down now. Um, brigade is our, it's bank holiday, so no brigades uh, tomorrow. Um, we've got um, play and stay um, and um, uh, some grace groups the Tuesday uh, lunchtime and the Wednesday lunchtime. Uh, but on um, Wednesday we've got our prayer Zoom, um, our prayer focus. Um, so 8 o'clock, 12.30 and 7.30 opportunities to gather together. Um, but let me just highlight 7.30 um, because we're actually going to be hybrid. So we're going to be here and also online. So if you want to come here and see Carl Pete in three dimensions, He's going to be joining us. He's the new minister at Oldbury Congregational Church. He's going to be sharing some things we can pray for him, and we're going to pray for him. But he's just going to join us and pray with us as we um, pray for things um, in house as well. So uh, that's what's going to happen on Wednesday. So exciting to be uh, actually having a physical prayer meeting, um, but there's also that option um, online as well. Hopefully that will work out okay. Um, uh, just a reminder: we've got a church meeting coming up um, at the end of the month. So if there are any Things that anyone wants to raise with us, elders, please do speak to us, um, and we'll hand over to Brian for the next one. I went to get some water before the service and spotted this. <laughs> do, you, do you remember the adverts? Have a break. Have a Kit Kat. Yeah. Well, have a break if you're of retirement age and come to daybreak. Okay. <laughs> Because uh, this is uh, something uh, very new, so new that it hasn't happened yet. And it's uh, a time for folk um, who are retired or of retirement age where we can get together, uh, have a break from the normal run of the day and the week, and spend some time, have some fellowship, do some fun activities. At the first one, uh, Mike is going to be um, helping us to put together some beautiful uh, hanging baskets. Uh, so if you would like to come and do that, come along and do that. If you'd like to come and just have a coffee and sit and chat with folks and watch others do hanging baskets, that's absolutely fine. But the, um, the normal time for it will be on Fridays, uh, second and fourth Fridays in the, in the month. And it will normally be between 2 o'clock and 3.30, but if you take one of these flyers uh, for yourself or perhaps to give to a friend uh, to invite them along, uh, you'll see that one of them um, is actually at an earlier time in June when we're going to have uh, a light sort of lunch together and we thought that 2 o'clock was probably a bit late to be having a light lunch. So um, that's what we're doing. Uh, the first one is uh, on the 13th. We went to Fridays because that kind of fitted in best with the rest of the church calendar and it does mean if you're having to come along and you've got homework to complete, then obviously it's Friday so you can do it on the weekend. Thanks. Well, the, 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 just on the table as you go out of the flyers um, there. The goal of these last notes is to make us feel really hungry um, because, um, having mentioned the lunch, um, uh, 22nd of May, I think it's coming up in a few Sunday times, a chance for us to eat together, bring our own lunch and eat together uh, here in the building. And then following that, in July, July the 3rd, church picnic, Samuel Valley, um, just sort of love that. Obviously it is weather dependent, so that's what we're going for, but um, it might change. Um, and if I've made you um, hungry enough, with those now refreshments. But as I say that, there's also a sign-up sheet. So we don't have, as yet, anyone plans to be doing serving refreshments for the coming weeks. So if you would be able to help in that way, it's a real help to everyone else, uh, that's where you sign up to help with refreshments in the coming weeks. But for now, we can just go and enjoy the refreshments um, this week. Thank you. Thank you.